Hey, welcome to A Little Better. My name is Daniel. I'll be your host. If you're a person interested in doing relationships better, this episode is for you. We go from single to married, how to build into your marriage, how to build into your singleness, and we hope you get this wisdom from our two special guests on this week's episode. Remember, our goal on the podcast is to know Jesus better and by the power of his spirit, do better so together we can be a little better. Hey, welcome to A Little Better. My name is Daniel, and I'm here with two first-time guests. Mr. Adam, you say hi. Say hi. Hi. <laughs> That's Adam. <laughs> and Jen. Hey. Awesome. And these guys are married. How yeah. long have you guys been married? Almost 18 years. 18 mm-hmm. years. How long have you been around Northridge? I've been here for about 21 years. Wow. Yeah. It was like before you were born? Like, no, no, no I'm, <laughs> I'm an old guy. <laughs> just kidding. Uh, Jen, how long have you been around? For 18 years. 18 I'm years. I'm here because of Adam. Wow. Mm-hmm. So Adam, tell us a little bit about what you do now at Northridge. You've been on staff for what, 13-ish? 11 years. 11 years, okay. Yep, the first 10 or so was uh, doing video production and working with our creative arts team. Um, and then about a year and a half ago, I transitioned and became the counseling pastor here at Northridge. And so yeah. I... It's pretty even jump, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, they're yeah. pretty closely connected. Cameras to yeah. people. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> so, um, so I do counseling. I lead our counseling team. Um, all the volunteers that are willing and able to walk alongside people that are struggling. And then I lead, uh, I coach groups here at nice. Northridge as well. Awesome. Jen, what about you? What do you, you've had a lot of roles at Northridge. And then, so what are a few of those and what do you do now? I've done a little bit of everything. I have done stage crew. I've done NYM. I've done kids ministry. I've done cafe. Um, I've done a little bit of everything. Currently in my serving roles, I'm doing kids men, third grade. Nice. First service and love my kids. And I also do cafe on the opposite weeks. So I've been doing that. Awesome. I also love my community group. Shout out. We have the best community group. Oh, okay. And so we've been doing some book studies and just getting together and growing together in our walk with the Lord and our walk with each other. It's been awesome. Nice. And you do serve with your older kids as in small groups, right? I do. Yeah. Yes. Which, which of your, you have four children, right? Four children. One is in the nursery still and then three older ones. My youngest just graduated from fifth grade and he is beyond excited to be in kindergarten. So he's now serving as an assistant in kindergarten. And when he was asked if he was coming back next week by one of his kids, he said, I will be here until you graduate fifth grade. Wow. That's that's a commitment. He's He's all in. Yeah. (laughs) Love that. My daughter Addison serves with me. Uh, in Kidsman and Cafe. And then my son Isaac has actually been getting into large group and teaching and tech and hosting and things like that yeah. in our large group. That's awesome. Mm-hmm. Fun plug for just serving in MIM. It's one of the top mm. four biggest predictors that your kid will be in church after they graduate high school is if they're in a serving ministry role where they get actual experience. And if you mm. want to give them actual experience, let them serve in Kidsman, let them serve Cafe, let them serve, let them go. Mm-hmm. It's one of the top predictors. So, but we're not here talking about that, uh, which we could spend a lot of time talking about it. This past weekend, I got the opportunity to preach uh, on our week four of our series, Summer, Summer on the Mount, on the Sermon on the Mount. Um, and so we talked about Jesus' word in Matthew 5, 27 through 32-ish uh, on sexual desire and when it goes wrong. And so I'm going to give you the sermon in 60 real fast, hosting and doing a little bit of that and seeing how this ties. So we talked about that our desires are a fire and uh, we need to give them context in order to let them burn well. Because like fire, our desires can either provide joy, warmth, goodness in our life or destroy it. And so part of our talk on Sunday, we talked about um, marriage and how to you know, properly build a fire. We start with the fire ring. We don't actually start with the fire wood or the fuel, like lighter fluid or something like that. You start with the fire ring. So today on the podcast, we're going to be talking more specifically about building that fire ring. So mm-hmm. from we're going to hopefully scope from singles to building into your marriage. So let's talk, let's start the conversation here with single single folks, all right, who may or may not have the desire to be married. Let's talk about both of those groups of what does what does building the context look like for them? Like what should the things that they should be focusing on, emphasizing in this season of singleness that may be longer or shorter for certain people? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so Adam and I didn't get married until I was 28. 
And in the world that I grew up in, the people that I was babysitting, I was attending their wedding. So I was considered an old maid. Mm. So I had a desire for marriage, but didn't know if God was going to grant that desire. So I spent a lot of time in, in focusing my relationship on God. I think a lot of times singles think that the story God is writing them will start when they meet their spouse. And mm. I, I don't think that God wastes any time. And so I think that it's really important when you're single, you will never have that kind of time again with God yeah. because a spouse is amazing, but distracting. Children, wonderful, but distracting. Wow, Adam. <laughs> very distracting. <laughs> very you know. distracting. You know, so don't look for, don't focus on a soulmate because that's going to take your eyes off of God. Grow that relationship with mm. God. Spend time with him. Learn those spiritual habits. Take time every day to be in his word. Learn how to pray and talk with him. And in doing that, I think he'll prepare you for the next day, but don't live for when my life doesn't start until. God mm. God is using you right now. We have lots of my friends are single, and I think sometimes they impact me more than my married friends mm. because they're so focused on God and their walk with him. Yeah. But I also sometimes see them thinking that they're not important until they're married, wow. and that is the furthest thing from the truth. They invest in their friends and in relationships far better than married people do, I yeah. think. Yeah. I would even add to that, like thinking about in my singleness before I got married, which I did get married really young. And so down South, that's a trend. Okay. Uh, <laughs> but we, we did, I won't, I won't share how old I was because there'll be some judging, you know, that happens. But, uh, but anyways, I think for me, I didn't actually start getting ready for marriage until I shifted my focus from, that significant other to like, I had a long standing relationship in high school, had way too much emphasis on it. Thought like, mm -hmm. we're going to be together forever. Like which every high school sweetheart couple thinks that way. Um, and then when, <clears throat> and then when we, uh, broke up, split up from our relationship, I had one of the best roommates in college who was one of the best friends in my life. Uh, and he really showed me what it meant to be a friend. Mm -hmm. And when I shifted my context from like, only romantic significant other relationships to I was a terrible friend throughout high school I didn't know what it meant to like have a guy like my best friends back or anything like spend time with them like no I gotta spend time with my girlfriend my girlfriend my girlfriend mm -hmm. and then that's three-year season in in college of just learning what it looked like to be a good friend and putting that emphasis there really changed and shaped who I was and now I'm just like what I look like in marriage of like not um you know only focusing on one relationship because obviously like our spouses are so important, but there's a really good book called made for friendship. Uh, mm -hmm. And it just walks through like what does biblical friendship look like? And it talks about just like how valuable and important friends are in our lives, um, which can be helpful for our, our context in every season of life, but really in our singleness season too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I echo those thoughts. And I think, you know, you know, you learn to be a good friend, you know, yeah. in that preparing time. And like Jen talked about, we're learning to be devoted to Christ when you mm -hmm. put him first. And those are things that are crucial in marriages, right? Yeah. If you mm -hmm. can't be a good friend to your spouse, if you don't have a, a devotion to Christ, your marriage is going to really, really struggle. Yeah. And so whether or not you ever do get married, those are, those are focuses that last a lifetime. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and so I think they're, they're really, really important. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think Sometimes the church has got a message messaging wrong when we talk about like love and and like marriage relationships because we talk about you know we need that agape love like you know love for our spouse is like the love that God has for us or whatever the case would be but you know Jesus this is just ripped straight from made for friendship he he epits the cross to a friendship type love mm -hmm. like of just loving he says you know greater has no love than one that lays down their life for mm -hmm. his friends and that's um, you know, that, that kind of love is really just foreign in our concept because we've so distorted friendship to it's like, Hey, it's an acquaintance. It's a friend on Facebook. It's a follow on Instagram. Mm -hmm. That's my friends. Yeah. When reality uh, crisis said my cross is an example of what friendship looks like. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah. So you guys have anything other than that? Like, okay, building into your relationship with God, building into friendships. What are some other ways in that single season of, um, Maybe the single season even looks like dating. What, is, what does that look like, investing in your marriage, thinking of that? Because by biblical definitions, you're either single or married, right? There's not, mm -hmm. like, there's not that hybrid that we've used in our culture of like, we're dating. Now we're exclusive. Or mm -hmm. before that, we're, we're talking. Now we're this. Now we're, like, we're all these 
all these labels of relationships. So single or married. So in that single season of prepping for marriage, what does that season look like uh, mm. to do that well? Yeah, that's good. One, I just think being intentional. So like in those friendships and relationships you have, um, find out what the other person's um, priorities are, right? So like if their priority is a devotion to Christ, well, okay, that's someone who might be worth getting to know more. I think a lot of times in our culture, right, there's this this attraction, this chemistry piece that I think people put first, Uh I think it's important, but I don't know that it's first. I think it's, hey, we have a shared vision for what Mm. the future looks like rather than, okay, I'm attracted to you. (laughs) I like being around you. But wow, you don't really have a relationship with Christ or it's not a focus of your life. So let me fix you. And then you now maybe you can become that person mm. that's worth investing in rather than starting the other way around and wow. saying like, wow, you have a devotion to Christ. Oh, and also, hey, here's this chemistry that's developed over time. Wow, that's good. Jen? Yeah, that's really good. That reminds me when I was single, my pastor growing up would often say, like, think of it as a triangle. Yeah. Don't look for mm-hmm. your spouse. Just get closer to God. And when you get closer to God, you'll find somebody else who's mm-hmm. getting closer to God, and that's yeah. how you'll find him. And I would definitely echo you know, be picky mm-hmm. when when you're yeah. dating because marriage is a long, long time. Mm-hmm. And we don't find out our annoying, quirky habits until you're spending 24-7 mm-hmm. with that other person. You can hide a lot in the dating time. But I would really strongly recommend following God's wisdom of marry someone who loves God. So when you're dating, look for friendships, guy and girl, who love God and then see where God takes that because I think that as seasons come and go in your marriage and there are some seasons that are easier than others, when those hard times come, you want your spouse to love you because they love God and not just feel like, you know what, you're just not doing it for me anymore. Mm -hmm. And so it's really important, I think, to be really picky and not just settle for I can change this person. I know for me too, another thing that I did was I wanted to be a good wife. And so I didn't really know what that meant. And so I read a lot of books (laughs) that talked about, you know, being a good wife and just habits that wives had. And I took, you know, what fit my personality and some things that I wasn't good at and needed to strive for and thought through, you know, I don't want to be a wife who puts down her husband. So in the dating time, I try to work on, I'm going to lift up this person and start those habits Mm. then, because you're, if you're, if you've got a little bit of a sarcastic teasing relationship during your dating time, I think that's only going to grow (laughs) when you're married and a little bit annoyed that, Mm. you know, maybe they left the toilet seat up again or something, which Mm. amen, praise the Lord is something that Adam was taught to never do. Hey, there you go. Shock shock collar. That really helps. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, I, th- I think the example has been used before of like, you know, I, if you think about our other comments of single, like building into your relationship with God, building your relationship with friends, of the track runner, like, you know, just keep your head down, run towards the prize, mm-hmm. and then every now and then just glance, see who's beside you, you mm-hmm. know, because the deeper you get into mm-hmm. the race, you know, the those who can't hang are going to fall behind, and then, you know, but just keep running, keep your head down, glance, see who's beside you, and then eventually you'll have other wise people who are running that race kind of bump you closer and closer together like mm-hmm. hey have you thought about you know That's good. Uh, which is just you know thinking about that community that biblical wisdom of of bringing other people's thoughts in mm-hmm. of um and i think one thing my my um older people in my life that didn't do a ton of that i wish they would have done more of give their opinions mm-hmm. um and, and that may not be everyone that was mine of like what do you think like you know should we pursue another step in our relationship of, but I think the more, if you're someone who's single, when you have wise people that you trust that know both of you well, I don't think that's a bad misstep of just, hey, mm-hmm. what do you think? You know, mm-hmm. we're thinking about this. Like, and when they give their honest opinion, like receive that well, like when they, cause they can see things you can't see. Cause as it's been said, when you're dating someone, you have the rose colored glasses mm-hmm. on. Everything's blinders. wonderful. Yep. You know, the blinders. <clears throat> are real, so. Oh yes. Good. In premarital counseling for the both of us, the pastor asked us, okay, what is one or two things you would change about the other? <laughs> and I said, Absolutely. nothing. I wouldn't change a 
thing he's about wonderful. him. Yeah, you're still looking for one or two things to change in your life. <laughs> I am, so, I am. Uh, looking for my quirks. Yeah, wow. Yeah, and, well. and, and that's a great segue into another thing. If you are find, do find yourself in a relationship yeah. and you're wondering about those next steps, I, premarital counseling is a must, right, in my opinion. Um, it's something that Northridge offers here um, to people that are part of our church. And so, man, we'd love to walk alongside young couples that are looking at making a forever commitment. And, yeah. and really the, the focus of premarital counseling is one with, with us is, is that first step of devotion to Christ, is that in place? Right. Mm. And so like, well, those are things that you want to make sure yeah. that the other person has. And mm-hmm. so let us do it. We'll ask the questions <laughs> and then you get to see what their answers are. If you yeah. haven't already talked about it, hopefully you wow. have, but there's just lots of things to work through that frankly, young couples, maybe they don't think through all of those things, yeah. or they just assume that that person who they're smitten with thinks the same way about that yeah. thing that they do. Mm-hmm. Um, and so premarital counseling gives an opportunity um, to put in that work, to ask those questions, and to figure out, like, okay, where are there tensions that we're going to have to navigate yeah. through this relationship? And are those tensions things that we're prepared to work through for the rest of our lives? Yeah. Or is this too big of an obstacle? And so, like, yeah. maybe this isn't wise to progress with this relationship. Yeah. Two, two questions I have about that. When, uh, sh- or I guess, when should a couple look for, like, you know, asking for premarital counseling? Like, is it, you know, when they're engaged or is it when they're three months out from the wedding day or, you know, when, when is it? And then, um, and then who, who should be doing it in that regard? Like who, uh, is it a couple who is engaged? Is it before they even get engaged? Like, yeah. So yeah. how, how soon to the wedding day or do they even need a wedding day in mind to do premarital sure, counseling? Sure. Yeah, we we tend to shoot for like four to six months out. If it's four months out, it's going to be a little bit more rapid fire. Yeah, six months is probably the sweet spot of like mm-hmm. six months out from the wedding. Hey, let's do this. Uh, we'll start to talk through these conversations. I think the important thing to remember about engagements is until you say I do. Yeah, there, there's nothing that's official, right? But that moment that you're on that stage and you say I do, well, now that's forever. That's a forever <laughs> right. commitment that you've made. But up until that point, it doesn't matter if invitations went out or deposits were paid on things, you can still make a wise decision that says, I don't, yeah. I don't know that this is a good right. plan. So, so six months out is generally the, um, the sweet spot with that's that. Good. And so, yeah, I would say engaged couples. I think when you're dating, that's the, there's things that you can be doing independently on your own, you know, great books and resources that you can read and say sure. like, Oh, are we ready for engagement yeah. before that's even a step? What's one great book that you would recommend? Um, there is a, there's a booklet when you put me on the spot. I don't remember. It's, uh, <laughs> I will get it. Do you have show notes? Yeah, we have show notes. We'll okay. put it in the show we'll notes. put it in the show notes. It's uh, just questions to ask. It's a little, it, what I love about it is it's real short, right? <laughs> there's not a ton of people these days that are like, ooh, let me read that 300-page book that yeah. you have to offer. But this is like a 10-page booklet. Yeah. That Gar- gets into Gary some- Chapman, who wrote Five Love Languages, mm-hmm. he has a really good book. One of the books Reen and I read and as we were prepping was Things I'd Wish I'd Known Before I Got Married. Mm-hmm. It's a long mm-hmm. title, but every chapter is like, I wish I would have known. Mm-hmm. And then it's like fill in the blank. Well, yeah. My favorite chapter it's funny but it's such derailed some convert like fights in our marriage that we've heard a lot of people have fights about it, the title of the chapter is things i wish i known before i got married that toilets weren't self-cleaning mm. so he talks about the tension in marriage of like if you grow up in a household where like dad does these chores but mom does these chores or if it's a single parent household then you have this pre you know preconceived assumption like oh well my other spouse is going to do that because that's what my Yep. Fill in the blank. Mom yep. or dad did, and then they they have the same in their mind. Like mm-hmm. if dad does all the cooking in one family, but mom does it all in the other, it's like, it's like, well, who's gonna t- yes. who's gonna cook? You know. And so yep. it's funny, but it was it was really helpful conversation for mm-hmm. us of just clarifying just the simple things. Uh, our premarital like pastor of counseling always said, "You're disarming the devil mm-hmm. when you figure these things out before mm-hmm. your tensions get high, because yeah, you already know like you're disarming the devil like where he can't get in between." So it was really good. Yeah. Um, all right. So say they do. How do they sign up? How do they let us know? Well, just like everything else here at Northridge, the first place to go is I want out info and I let us know. Hey, we're looking for premarital counseling, and then I can get them connected with the the best fit for them. Nice. That's awesome. So the wedding has happened. Right. Yep. How, how, what do they do now? Are they just like, awesome, you're doing great, kill it? Yeah, great question. What Jen? do we do now? <laughs> um, I think that's where you need to have grace, mm-hmm. communication, people that you can talk to, you know, mentors. I think that having people who have been married for a season of time before you, maybe having those relationships in place 
because I know, especially in the first year of our marriage, I, I think our first big fight was over potato mashers. Mm. <laughs> but Isn't that everyone's first big fight, though, really? Ours yeah. was how to slice peppers. So. Oh, okay, okay. Oh, that yeah, makes similar, me feel very better. Similar. Yeah. She yeah. didn't do it right. So. <laughs> <laughs> we had two. He wanted me to make a decision. I hadn't used either. I wasn't ready to make a decision. But, you know, when you're first married, you are used to doing things your way. And so I think seeking out friendships of couples that are older than you mm. and allowing those friendships to grow with you as you grow your marriage, I think mm. is a really helpful thing. Yeah. And this is a shameless plug for all things Northridge. And one of the things we cover in premarital is getting plugged in to a local church is a must, right? Yeah. So like, so th- those mentors can come from community groups. Sometimes it's, oh, because I'm serving, I, yeah. sh- I served with this couple and like, wow, their mm-hmm. marriage looks awesome and yeah. I want to spend some time with them, yeah. right? And it's just this organic thing that happens with the body of Christ. But if you're disconnected from the body of Christ, mm. you're, not, you're not getting that. And it's just the two of you trying to do the best you can. And yeah. hopefully there's people in your family that are speaking wisely into mm. you, but a lot of people don't have that, right? Yeah. So those, those different uh, broken situations that yeah. are not helpful. So, so the de- you're saying so the deeper and deeper you get connected into the local church, the more organically those things happen. Like it's hard. We've had multiple conversations like how do we systematize this, systematize yeah. this, but ultimately it's the deeper people get connected, like with serving opportunities in community groups. Mm-hmm. Like you're going to know more and more people at your campus. Mm-hmm. Thus, will spark like. I really like their marriage. Yeah. You know, that's exactly how for Rena and I, it's happened every time. Like when we have a mentor couple, they're like, oh, I really like, you know, mm-hmm. they've been married 10 years when we were like one year in. Like, yeah. how did they get there? Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. or it's like the 30 year or the 40 year. It's like, how'd you get there? Mm-hmm. Um, it's really helpful. So, mm-hmm. so how would a married couple just with the two of them say they have a mentor couple? Um, they're they're kind of going the ebb and flow of their marriage. What does it look like to daily um, or just, I guess, broaden the question even more. What does it look like to invest in your marriage? Should we spend time investing in our marriage? And how yes. do we do that? Yes, we should. We okay, should how do we do that? How, how and how often? Yeah, that's good. I think the daily thing is, one, I think your daily investment in your marriage is your daily investment into your relationship with Christ, right? So one of the things I talk about in premarital counseling all the time is... Um, the quality of your relationship with Christ will determine the quality of your marriage, right? So if you're not connecting with him, <clears throat> if you're not experiencing his grace and mercy in your life, mm-hmm. you're not going to be able to show that grace and mercy to your spouse. And if there's anything every marriage needs, it's grace and mercy, right? Because mm-hmm. it's two sinners that are coming together. So I think that daily investment in your marriage starts with the daily investment in Christ. Um, and then it's following commands. My, my favorite chapter in probably all of the Bible, if, if anyone's ever been in counseling with me, they're not surprised by what I'm going to talk about. It's Ephesians 4, mm-hmm. right? And so that's the, that's the passage I work through with marriage, married couples. And people might say, like, wait, don't you mean Ephesians 5? Like, <laughs> Ephesians 5 is what it's all about, marriage. But Ephesians 4 is all about godly communication, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. And that's not just for married people, but single people as well. But Ephesians 4, too, be completely humble and gentle, patient, bearing with one another in love. And so that's the daily investment is those little moments about toilet seats and potato mashers and peel and peppers. Like, mm-hmm. if you can have grace in those moments and and show God's love to your spouse, you're going to have an incredible marriage, right? And if you don't do that, you're going to build a wall of a barrier between the two of you, or you just move slowly and slowly further and further away from each other. Nice. Mm -hmm. That's good. Yeah. I think for me, what I tried to do early on in our marriage, and it has now just become habits, is we've talked about out serving one another. Mm. And so daily serve my husband. And it's not, you know, sometimes, especially early on in our marriage, before we had children, I would do all sorts of things. And you know, friends would come over and like kind of make fun of me a little bit. But every time I serve Adam or every time he serves me, and to be honest, I think that serving looks different, Mm. um, but it grows our relationship and it deepens our love and our commitment to each other. So like my way of serving him was to do, he loved having his meals made and snacks made at night and things like that. I love to be served by being really patient with my emotions. (laughs) So whenever I'm talking about something or if I'm super excited or if I'm really sad, the patience that he shows in sitting there and being there for the entire conversation and not making me feel stupid, that's a way that he can serve me. So I think serving one another and trying to outserve, that's just kindness. Mm -hmm. And kindness just multiplies and grows and deepens. I also think 
communicating expectations. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of times daily, I actually just listened to something that said every day try to give one, communicate one expectation. Because what we don't realize is the resentment that we start building towards our spouse is just unmet expectations all day long. You know, he left his socks on the couch or he didn't put his shoes away or he left the toilet seat up or how come this isn't in the dishwasher or or I want him to respond to me like this or I don't like that. But if we don't communicate, your spouse has no idea that these mm-hmm. little frustrations are growing. And when you don't deal with something when it's small before you know it, it's really big. Mm-hmm. I think that's something daily that you can pay attention to. And another thing that I think has really helped our marriage is Adam and I decided from the beginning um, to not be sarcastic with each other. I know that a lot of couples are sarcastic and it brings fun, but a lot of times sarcastic often leads to arguments because you put in those mm. unmet like, oh, I didn't mean it like that. Yeah. How right. Many times I said it that? comes yeah. into like the sarcastic. Yeah. And so, you know, be careful how you speak to your husband or your, or your wife with respect, but be careful how you speak about them to others. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and I, I know a lot of times for me, when girls get together, it's very quick to talk about how their husbands are frustrating them or challenging mm. them. So, you know, find that trusted friend or a trusted mentor that you can talk to about things that you are struggling with yeah. that will point you to Jesus and not blame your, your spouse. Mm-hmm. And then for everybody else, lift your spouse up. Yeah. Be respectful of them. Talk That's about great. the things that you love about them and, and what they do. And not in a way to be like, my spouse is better than yours, <laughs> but that honor and respect that you give to the other one grows love in yeah. your own heart yeah. and grows love in their heart when they hear you speaking about them. And it's, it's all these little things mm. that I think make a really big difference and can help you to have a good marriage. And yeah. Yeah. And I would just add, don't don't just do it with other people. Do it with them too. Yeah, that's another thing that we cover in marriage counseling a ton. Is you know you're you're looking for the work of the Holy Spirit in your spouse mm. and encourage them. Right, that's Ephesians four twenty nine. Right, so like yeah. encourage the if good you things think that it, you see. Say it. Yeah, yeah right? that's right. So that's yeah. good. So all right, guys, we're gonna do a one minute wrap up. So what is one more piece of advice to invest in your marriage on? Uh, on a bigger scale, it could be a weekly, a monthly, a yearly thing. Uh, what's one more thing you would add to this conversation? Um, God has been impressing on me lately the importance of being his hands and feet and that it is his kindness that leads to repentance. And so to think through that to whoever you are around, a spouse or friends, if you're single, if you're married, be the hands and feet of Jesus and treat people with kindness and then just see where God takes that. Yeah. Um, I'm going to break a rule, which is not like me because I'm not a rule breaker, but I'm going to give you two things. I think praying together Mm -hmm. and regular date nights are super Mm -hmm. important. And the seasons of our life can like squeeze really important things out. Um, But whatever that looks like for you, if it's weekly, if it's monthly, um, don't neglect those two things because there's nothing Mm -hmm. like approaching the throne of God with Mm -hmm. your spouse. Like if you are harboring any bitterness, you (laughs) hear them praying to God. It just changes Mm -hmm. your heart towards them. And the same is true when you're praying as well. And so, and date nights are important. Um, yeah. Whether you have kids, whether you don't have kids, whether yeah. all your kids are grown and gone, um, uh, do date nights. That's awesome. Well, thank you guys so much for giving all your wisdom and just input. I know you, we felt like we just scratched the surface in so many ways, but you gave so many nuggets of wisdom in that regard, and uh, we appreciate it. We hope to have both of you back real soon. Ooh, Thanks so much for listening to this week's episode. Uh, we can't wait to hang out with you again next week. <laughs>